and welcome. It's me again, Dawn Brooks, uh, author of Cozy Mysteries, and I've written a few memoirs as well. Uh, and this is the continuation of A Christmas Cruise Murder, which is book five in the Rachel Prince Mystery Series, and this will be chapters 16 to 18. Remember, if you would like to get the whole thing uh, for, for you to keep forever, you can buy at a permanently discounted price at Authors Direct. The link will be below this video. Or you can get on Audible or borrow through your local audiobook libraries for free or buy at any other audiobook store. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy this video. Chapter 16 I can't believe you really want me to impersonate a counsellor, Sarah. It doesn't feel right. What if these people are not murderers or accomplices in blackmail, and they do need proper counselling? You just say go on and encourage them to speak. That's what the most counsellors seem to do, said Bernard, who was sitting with them in Gwen's office, waiting for the Gonzalez couple to arrive. Sarah nudged him. That's a low comment, Bernard, even for you. Bernard grinned and puffed his chest out, as only he could. It's true, they don't say a lot, just ask questions. You're good at asking questions, Rachel. I still don't like it. Asking questions as a police officer is one thing. This is quite different. I know nothing about counselling. You know even less about nursing, so we can't pretend you're a nurse, can we? Sarah interrupted. Anyway, you've counselled me through some difficult times, and you are a vicar's daughter. Oh, and that makes me a counsellor by default, does it? And friendship is different because you have done the same for me on multiple occasions. You're overthinking it, Rachel, said Bernard. Consider it undercover work. I'm surprised Dr. Bentley has agreed to this anyway. You could do it in your professional capacity as a nurse, either one of you. I would be too soft to miss the signals, said Sarah, and I would be too impatient. I don't hold to all this navel-gazing baloney. Bernard, you drive me to distraction at times, Sarah scolded. Rachel laughed. Bernard's humor always won her over. <laughs> all right, I'll just say go on and hope they do. Failing that, I'll go into police mode and quiz them as suspects. Then you'll be sorry. I'm pleased to see you're all enjoying yourselves. Gwen came into the office alongside Dr. Bentley. <laughs> it's Bernard's fault, said Sarah, still giggling. Don't ever send him for counselling, whatever you do. Bernard rolled his eyes to the sky, looking innocently at his boss. Don't you give me the innocent look, Bernard. I've been sorely tempted to do just that on numerous occasions, so watch yourself, mate. Anyway, I'm pleased you made them laugh. Rachel, are you ready? I suppose so. Are you coming too, Gwen? I'll stay in with you initially. We've decided to use this room while Graham gives them the news, and then we'll both depart and leave you to your, um, counselling. Are you sure you're happy to do this, Rachel? asked Dr. Bentley. I'm glad someone cares what I think about this. I seem to have been bulldozed into it as a matter of fact. But you know me. I can't keep my nose out of any investigation, so I'm resigned. It will be a good way of meeting the couple without stalking them. In that case, let's get it over with. I do wish Chief Waverley wouldn't interfere with the running of the medical centre. Sarah squeezed Rachel's hand, and Bernard gave her a nod of encouragement couldn't resist a word or two. Go on, to which the three of them laughed, leaving Gwen and Dr. Bentley staring in bemusement. Right, you two children, get out of my office, we need it. Sarah and Bernard left, and Gwen called in the couple, who'd arrived in the waiting room as the others were leaving. Do come in, Mr. and Mrs. Gonzalez. They entered the office, Dr. Bentley and Rachel stood. Please, take a seat. The confused couple sat on the small sofa, while Gwen, the doctor, and Rachel sat in the chairs. Before we start, can I get you a coffee? 
asked Gwen as Raggy entered with a tray of tea and coffee and placed it on the table. Paolo Gonzalez spoke first. A coffee would be appreciated, thank you. I must ask, what is this all about? His sharp eyes hidden beneath designer spectacles were already taking in the three people in front of him. He was tall and distinguished in appearance and aged 60. The latter fact Rachel knew from his passenger information records. Quite, said Dr. Bentley while Gwen poured coffees all round. Stella Gonzalez had her brother's nose, Rachel thought, but there the likeness ended. She was beautiful. Long brown hair, almost as long as Rachel's own, and deep green eyes behind the longest lashes she had ever seen that weren't false. The woman was slim, but not thin and immaculately groomed and dressed. Her hand shook slightly when she picked up her coffee. I'm Dr. Bentley, the senior medical officer on board the Coral Queen. This is our senior nurse, Sister Sumner, and this is Rachel Prince, our onboard counselor. Four eyes shot towards Rachel. And why would we need a counselor, Dr. Bentley? Gonzalez asked, still holding Rachel's gaze. Dr. Bentley ignored Gonzalez and addressed his wife. Mrs. Gonzalez, I understand you have a brother on board this ship, Stefan Sosa. Really? Is Stefan on board? We haven't spoken for a while, I didn't know. A flicker of the eyelids and loss of eye contact told Rachel the woman was not telling the truth. She was now pleased to be here and sat back, observing closely. You didn't know? If that's all this is about, Doctor, I think we can leave now. We don't want to meet Stefan. He has hurt his family in many ways. Come on, darling, let's go. Before Paolo Gonzalez had the chance to move, Gwen interceded. You should hear what Dr. Bentley has to say before you go, please. She appealed to Stella, who remained seated, causing her husband to rejoin her. I'm afraid I have some bad news, Mrs. Gonzalez. Your brother was found dead in his cabin on the evening we left Southampton. Stella almost spilt her coffee as her hand increased its shaking. Found dead? I'm sorry to say, yes, his body was returned to Southampton for a post-mortem later that night. Drink, I suppose. He drank too much. That was his problem. Paolo, don't. He was still my brother. Drink did have something to do with it, Mr. Gonzalez, but not in the way you imply. Someone added something to his drink that resulted in a fatal reaction. Rachel watched both responses closely and couldn't tell if they were good actors, or they really didn't know Stefan was aboard, or that he was dead. It seemed unlikely, and Gonzalez was reacting a little too calmly for her liking. You mean he was poisoned? I am afraid, doctor, he did have a knack of upsetting people, so it doesn't come as a big surprise. That sort of thing happens in Cuba all the time, but I didn't expect it to occur on a cruise ship. Why would anyone want to poison him? Asked Stella, ignoring her husband and pushing his hand away. We're not sure yet. Our security team is investigating, and I expect one of the team will be wanting to speak with you later today or tomorrow. I really am sorry to be the bearer of bad news. This must come as a big shock. Do you know anyone who might have intended to harm your brother? Gonzalez swung his head back in Rachel's direction. Of course not. We've already told you we didn't keep in touch. Stella gripped his arm quietening him and spoke softly. We lost touch around 16 months ago. Stefan came to visit us in Cuba. He drank too much and became uncontrollable. He had always drunk, but not like he did then. One night, the liquor caused his tongue to become too loose, and he insulted me and my parents. Paolo told him to be quiet, but he wouldn't stop. He ranted and raved at us all. 
My mother was dying, but he didn't seem to care. My father got up to hit him, but he was a frail old man. Stefan pushed him and he fell. Paolo could not take any more. He intervened, punched Stefan and threw him out of the house, telling him never to return. Stefan called me the next day to apologize, but I was still angry with him. He told me to tell our mother he was sorry. I told him to go to hell. Tears now ran down Stella's cheeks, causing her mascara to run. So, you see, we had no reason to see the man again. We were not friends. Paolo's anger spilled over to compensate for his wife's tears. And did you ever see him again? Rachel asked gently. A week later, my mother died. I sent him a letter to inform him, but told him it would be better if he stayed away from the funeral because our father would not want him there. He was back on board your ship by then anyway. Paolo stared angrily at his wife. You never told me you contacted him. I bet you didn't tell your father either. Stella hid her eyes in a handkerchief her husband had supplied before looking at him. I didn't tell you because I knew you would be angry like you are now. I told father a few weeks after the funeral. I told him Stefan was their only son and he deserved to know. He nodded and we never spoke of it again. Rachel almost felt pity for the wayward Stefan being ordered to stay away from his own mother's funeral. But if he'd really wanted to be there, surely he would have made the effort to be reconciled with the family he had hurt so much. Did he reply to your letter? She asked. No, I didn't hear from him again. I wrote to him six months ago to let him know that father had died. But he didn't reply to that letter either. You knew he was on this ship, didn't you? Her husband's voice became accusing. So what if I did? I wanted to tell him in person about the pain he'd caused her father and that father had chosen to write both of us out of his will as a result. Dr. Bentley and Gwen exited without the couple noticing while Rachel poured another round of coffee. She let the quiet hang for a few minutes before breaking it. Go on, she said, forcing herself not to smile. I'm sorry, Paolo. I knew you would refuse if I told you. I need to see my brother and tell him how much he'd cost us. And now your business is failing. I don't know what we're going to do. I wanted to ask him to speak to his son and see if Mikey would be generous to us. Stella turned to Rachel. I'm not in the habit of begging, but things are difficult in Cuba. Without money, we are nothing. How did you know about the business? I'm not stupid, Paolo. You were becoming distant, snappy. At first I thought it was another woman. Then I sneaked a look in your office and found the rejected loan applications. Paolo softened, pulling his wife into his arms and allowing her to cry on his shoulder. He looked at Rachel. Things have been difficult, but what this silly woman doesn't know he stroked his wife's hair, is that I have a buyer for the business, an investor who is happy to keep me on. And we will have enough money from the sale to be quite comfortable for as long as we live. I should have told you, Stella, but I thought you would prefer not to know. Stella had ceased crying and lifted her head up. I'm not one of those stupid Cuban women who doesn't have a clue what's going on. I am my mother's daughter, she said proudly. So this whole trip has been a waste of time. In terms of begging that wretched brother of yours for money, yes. But we still have Christmas to look forward to. Turning to Rachel again, Gonzalez continued, Stefan would never have agreed anyway. He was only interested in himself. I'm not even sure he knew where his son lived, let alone stood a chance of asking the young man for money. Any money he could have squeezed out of the boy would have been spent on Stefan Sosa, no one else. 
My wife has always believed her brother was redeemable, but he wasn't. I won't speak ill of the dead any further, but the man was rotten right through, with no good qualities to save him. Stella nodded. I've been silly, but I am sorry my brother is dead. Whether or not he was a bad man, he was the only brother I had. I'm afraid your brother had discovered where his son was. Rachel didn't fill Stella in on the marriage violence, but told her he hired a private investigator who traced his ex-wife to London. He also had the address of the university where your nephew is studying in his belongings. I don't think any contact would have been encouraged from either party, though. Does Christine know about my brother's death? Yes, as does his son, Michael. Oh, please, Paolo, can we spend a few days in England after the cruise? I'd love to see Christine and Mikey. We got on so well, and then they stopped communicating when she left him. Rachel felt it best that the reason for the marriage breakup come from Christine Jones, not from her. Have you tried to contact your brother since you've been on board? I've asked a few of the waiters in the buffet when Paolo hasn't been there, but none of them seemed to know him. Rachel thought that was odd, but said nothing. I will agree to stay in London for five days after the cruise, and then we must fly home. I have to get back to the business and sign papers to seal the deal. Now I think we have taken up enough of this young woman's time. Shall we go? Who will arrange the funeral? Stella looked at Rachel again. I'm sorry, I don't know, answered Rachel, thinking it would be unlikely that Michael or Christine would want to foot the bill for their estranged father-stroke husband's final farewell. I expect it might be covered by insurance. I'll ask Dr. Bentley for you. Paolo helped his wife to her feet and led her out of the office. Rachel hoped neither of them was involved in the demise of Stefan Souza. It appeared they had suffered enough at his hands already. At least Stella had. Chapter 17 Rachel joined Sarah and her parents for dinner in the club restaurant. The restaurant was brightly lit with Christmas decorations and busy but not full, so it gave her the opportunity to observe the waiters in a new light, knowing some of the secrets they were hiding. She saw Mishka for what he was, a sneaky drug dealer who resented Stefan Sosa for blackmailing him over the issue. If it had been hard drugs, he would be at the top of her list because of the sums of money involved. But a small cannabis smuggling operation, though unwelcome on board a cruise ship, was not big enough to make him a drug baron or anything like it. She also noticed for the first time how Mishka shunned Danielle and snapped at her when out of earshot of diners. Obviously, he believed Danielle had told Sosa his secret and had it in for her. Pash continued his avoidance technique whenever he was near their table. He charmed the Bradshaws with his bright white smile, but blanked Rachel. Not that she minded. Her only interest in him was as a suspect. She had no wish to be his friend, but it did make it more difficult to find out anything from him. She had an idea who would be good at pumping him for information and would discuss it with Sarah and Jason once the Bradshaws busied themselves with other activities. Rachel, you're doing it again, Mary chided while staring in her direction. What? Oh, uh, sorry, I was miles away, Rachel smiled meekly. That young man of yours has a lot to answer for, going away and leaving you at this time of year. I should be having words when I next see him. It's not right. I can see how disappointed you are. When will you men learn? Mary's stern look was now directed at the gentle Gilbert Bradshaw, who sensibly continued eating. Rachel felt confused for a moment before realizing that Mary had wrongly assumed she was still missing Carlos. The thought brought her up with a start. Why am I not missing him? Thankfully, she had to park the question. 
Mary Bradshaw was in full flow on the topic of young love, but Sarah and Jason were now the ones high on her radar. Sarah reddened under the pressure and chewed her bottom lip, a habit she had when under stress, and one that Rachel had always picked up on at university when they shared accommodation. At least Sarah was holding her tongue and not antagonizing her mother. What are you doing after dinner this evening? Rachel felt it was time to divert the conversation, and her friend shot her a grateful glance. Gilbert Bradshaw answered. Mary had a visit to the hairdressers this afternoon, so I'm taking her to the indoor cinema. She always likes a treat after she's had her hair done, although why on earth she decides to waste an afternoon of our holiday in such a way when her hair looks perfectly respectable? I don't know. You know I have my hair done once a week, come what may, Gilbert. Sarah and Rachel laughed as it was a cause of some consternation in the Bradshaw home when a bank holiday dared to fall on a hairdressing day. Bank holidays were the only times when Mary deferred or brought forward her hairdressing appointments. Mum, you are funny. I hope you know you probably paid four times as much as having it done at home. Mary blushed, and now it was she who changed the subject. Your father had some gaming lessons in the casino, and that's far worse than having a weekly hairdressing treat, if you ask me. Following a period of friendly banter around the table, Sarah's parents left to head for the cinema. Rachel and Sarah opted to hang around and order tea, while Rachel filled her friend in on the meeting with the Gonzaleses and the subsequent revelations. They roared with laughter, causing a few heads to turn, when Rachel described how she told Stella Gonzalez to go on. You'll never forget that, will you? Bernard can be such a card at times. His humorous interpretation of counselling did relax me enough to go in there, so I will have to thank him. Don't you dare, you'll be unbearable. Okay, I'll thank him in my head rather than out loud. Anyway, they were a nice couple, I thought, although Paolo could be a bit prickly. I sort of hope they're not involved in this, but I find it hard to believe that Stella at least hadn't been in contact with Sosa about the trip. It would surprise me if they hadn't arranged to meet up during this cruise. They did seem genuinely shocked about the death, though. What about Paolo? Do you believe he was unaware of his wife's contact with her brother and her intention to ask him to help recruit her nephew for financial help? He was harder to read. He did put on a good show of being affronted at finding out, but he doesn't seem like the sort of man who wouldn't know what was going on in his own household. I would very much like to speak to both of them separately and see if either of them trips up. Stella? appeared to be telling the truth for most of the time, and relieved to be getting it out in the open. Having said that, the tears dried up quickly once she knew her husband's business was out of trouble. So her distress was more about money, and not over her brother's untimely death, that's for sure. I don't think I can hold that against her. He was a ghastly man by all accounts. Even Bernard didn't like him, and he likes everyone. As do you, Sarah Bradshaw. So if you don't feel sorry about Sosa's death, he must have been horrible. I haven't managed to dig up any redeeming features about his character from anyone. I wouldn't say I'm not sorry about his death, but perhaps the world won't miss him too much. Mishka arrived with tea and began pouring for them. How are you, Mishka? asked Sarah innocently. I am well, nurse. I enjoyed our talk in Fatima yesterday, and I have had no further problems with my eyes since you treated them. Mishka's face brightened. It was hard for anyone not to like Rachel's best friend, one of the kindest people on the planet as far as she was concerned. I expect you're all having to work extra hard since Stefan departed. Rachel spoke quietly, although they were not in earshot of any other passengers. We are, but it's a burden we are happy to bear to be rid of the man. Mishka left them to drink their tea. Do you think it was him, Rachel? Sarah whispered. No, I don't think so. A man so openly hostile doesn't go to the top of my list. 
Our killer would be more subtle, I believe. Having said that, maybe he doesn't have the brains to hide his feelings. Although some murderers play with you and almost challenge you to prove their guilt. And if that's the case, he is highly intelligent. He's a paradox, though, isn't he? One minute he's having a religious experience, the next we find out he's a drug dealer. Perhaps his religious experience will help him change his ways. You were at the meeting with Waverley. He sold drugs the day after his so-called spiritual revelation. It obviously wasn't a Damascus Road enlightenment, but that doesn't mean it wasn't real. My father always says that the proof of a religious experience is in the life that follows. Otherwise, it makes a nonsense of everything he teaches. Well, I wouldn't argue with Brendan Prince about theology, but back to the present. We're not doing very well with this one, are we? Jason's frantic with worry over Brenda's possible involvement. I do so hope it is one of the waiters. It could also be Claudia Kitova, who managed to keep herself under the radar until we found out she was also being blackmailed. We still don't know why. I was hoping you or Bernard could speak to her and find out. Already done, Sherlock. Jason asked Bernard to find out. And he only told me what he'd discovered tonight after surgery. So Jason doesn't know yet. Apparently, the poor woman made the mistake of confiding in Sosa that she'd found a gold brooch belonging to a passenger and kept it. She felt guilty afterwards and asked his advice as to whether she would be fired if she handed it in a few weeks later. He told her yes, and then began blackmailing her. I do hope Waverley doesn't go after her, although she might have been desperate enough if Sosa tried to exhort more money from her than she could afford. You're right, but she wanted to return the brooch, so she's honest underneath it all. I can't believe she would resort to murder. She does seem an unlikely candidate, but she was the last person to see him alive. Also, he may have had something else on her that we haven't yet discovered. But wouldn't it be rather foolish to be the one to deliver his final meal and then find the body afterwards? Or oh, very clever, said Rachel, rubbing her head, frustrated that she was no nearer to discovering Sosa's killer than before. Changing the subject, Sarah, do you think there's something wrong with me? What do you mean? Twice now your mother has assumed I've been missing Carlos, when I haven't even been thinking about him. It makes me wonder whether I love him at all. Don't take any notice of Mum, you know what she's like. To her, love is everything. She sees romance under every bush. I blame Barbara Cartland. <laughs> Rachel laughed. But surely I should be thinking about him. Rachel Prince. I've known you all my life, and when there's a puzzle to be solved, nothing and no one gets in the way of it. Remember, we're different people to our parents. We don't hang on every word of the men in our lives, but it doesn't mean we don't love them. Mum's a romantic, she sees the world through a glass. Perhaps I still have so many doubts over whether I can ever truly commit again. Rachel, if you don't stop, Harking back to the past, you won't ever move on. It's just plain fear. But you know in your heart of hearts that Carlos is the one for you. When did you last think of him? When I woke up this morning? I even debated paying the hefty price for maritime roaming. If I had done, I might have saved myself from being attacked. Hmm. There you are. You compartmentalize, Rachel. That's who you are, and Carlos wouldn't want you any other way. It doesn't mean you don't love him. He knows that. If there wasn't a murder investigation going on, you'd most likely be pining away and running yourself to death up on deck 16. They laughed at the reference to Rachel's keep fit fanaticism. Well, that's something I am missing. Perhaps I'm... Go on said Sarah, and they both burst into another giggling fit, preventing Rachel from saying whatever it was she had been about to say. Come on, 
Let's get out of here before Pash throws us out, she said instead. The glare boring through the back of her head made her almost wish the new head waiter would turn out to be the killer. There were few people she disliked to any degree, but Pash was becoming one of them. She was convinced he would step into Sosa's shoes in every way, and the waiter's current respite would soon be over. She had no doubt Pash would not be averse to a touch of blackmail himself, but perhaps she was just being unkind. Chapter 18 The familiar figure of CSO Jack Waverley loomed outside Rachel's stateroom when she returned. If it wasn't a cliché, I would say again we really should stop meeting like this, Chief. I can only apologize, Miss Prince. May I come in? The seriousness in his tone and the Miss Prince usage warned Rachel not to make any further wisecracks. Yes, of course. Waverley followed her through to the sitting area and flopped down on the sofa. Drink? Scotch, please. Blimey, it must be serious. Rachel poured a whiskey from the mini bar and helped herself to a tonic water. What on earth's the matter? His right hand stroked through the receding hairline, and the familiar cough preceded any attempt at conversation. He swallowed the whiskey in one gulp. <clears throat> Brenda's gone missing. I don't know what to do. I think you had better explain what you mean by gone missing. It's quite difficult to go missing on the coral, but I don't need to tell you that. Is she not at work? We had a row after I questioned her father. She got it in her head I didn't believe her when she told me she had nothing to do with Sosa's death. She's been on paid absence from the bakery since this business started. She's due back tomorrow. Could you not just reassure her that you do believe her? Assuming you do, that is. Of course I do. It's just that Richard's alibi for the hours before Sosa's death is that he went to his room to unpack but nobody can confirm it. Also, he now admits he had a row with Sosa on the dockside. He denied it until I told him Goodridge had messaged to inform me that a passenger had identified him, and then both he and Brenda became defensive. I challenged Brenda about the short time she went missing from the bakery after cutting her finger, and it all got out of hand. I left them to cool down while I met with Goodridge in my office. I've just been back to our room. She's packed a bag and disappeared. So she's not really gone missing. She's, um, temporarily left you. Rachel tried to sound calm. I know what you're thinking. You think I should have stayed out of it and let Goodridge speak to them. Well, it might have been less confrontational. You know you're too close to this. So, yes, that would have been better but there's not much point worrying about that now. What am I going to do? I think I should just leave her to calm down, wait until the case is solved, then patch it up. And leave Brenda thinking forever that you don't trust her. No, you need to find her and convince her that you believe her now and that you were playing the role of bad cop because that's what she would be likely to face from anyone else and you'd rather it came from you. Then you need to apologize. But I didn't do anything wrong. Chief, what's more important to you? Your pride or getting your wife back? He smiled for the first time since entering the room. You're wise beyond your years, Rachel Prince. I'm terrified of losing her. It scares me so much it hurts. What would I ever do if she is involved? I don't believe that, neither do you. Richard Jones may have come aboard to warn Sosa to stay away from his family, but do you seriously believe either he or Brenda could be involved in this? Also, why would she implicate herself in the bakery? There's no way she would have known when Sosa would order food. But it wasn't in the food. Nevertheless, if she had known about the substance in the whiskey, she would have somehow delayed his meal so the galley would play no part in the investigation. I'm sure your wife is intelligent. Implicating herself would have been stupidity. 
the meal was ordered by coincidence. I also don't have your wife or father-in-law, not that I know him, down as cold-blooded killers. The more I think about it, the more I don't believe it's them. If they had killed him, it would have been a spur-of-the-moment thing, not in this calculated fashion. And it was such a cruel way to kill someone. He must have been in agony. You're right. I knew it anyway, but thank you, Rachel. I'm convinced. Now, you'd better go and convey that conviction to your wife and father-in-law. Don't let this fester. Waverley hesitated. I'll ask you about your progress tomorrow, but for now, I need to find my wife. She can't have gone far. Rachel heaved a sigh of relief after he left and hoped she was right in her judgment that Richard and Brenda were truly innocent of any crime. Now it was time to work out her next steps. Usually she would go to the gym and mull things over during a workout, but her hip was still sore from the stitches, and she didn't want them to come apart. It was frustrating not being able to exercise, as this was her go-to relaxation method. Perhaps some music would help. She picked up her iPhone and noticed there was a message from Carlos. There must have been a temporary signal again. Her heart leapt when she read it. Case almost solved. Hope to join ship on one of the Canary stops. We'll let you know when confirmed. Jason says I can bunk in with him. Now she was far too excited to concentrate on suspects and murder. Carlos would be joining the ship in time for Christmas. She couldn't wait to let Sarah know, unless Jason had already told her. There was no signal on her phone to send a reply, but she picked up the stateroom phone and dialed her friend's number. Hello. Guess what? You've heard then, Sarah giggled. I wanted to tell you over dinner as I knew already, but Jason wouldn't let me. He said it was down to Carlos to tell you. I'm so pleased, Rachel. We're going to have a wonderful Christmas now. My parents will be over the moon. Nice that someone doesn't know before me. It's not like that. I was with Jason in Waverley's office before I met you and my parents when the call came through. Carlos wanted to check he would have somewhere to stay before getting your hopes up, and Jason had to get approval from the captain. Guest services contacted head office, and they will add him as Jason's guest to join the ship as soon as we know when he's coming. We can't just let anyone walk on board a fully booked ship, you know. Oh, I should have thought of that. Of course you can't. Is Jason all right about it? He's fine. He likes Carlos and was used to sharing with a lot more people in the army. Anyway, he's got a sofa bed in his room. The two of them will be talking late into the night. Sometimes I think men are worse than women when it comes to gossip. I can't thank Jason enough. This will be the best Christmas ever. Until I received the text message, I think I was shutting off my emotions. I was so disappointed not to be having our planned time together, I went into shutdown. I know that, Rachel. It was obvious to me. Remember? I can read you. I recognize the signs. Why didn't you say something? I almost did when you were worrying about your feelings earlier, but sometimes you have to work it out for yourself. Actually, I'm hoping Carlos will be a good influence on Jason. He might be able to get him to open up about Afghanistan and his own commitment issues. Do you want me to ask him to try? No, I don't want Jason to think I'm manipulating things behind the scenes. That's the last thing he needs. I would rather it came naturally, otherwise neither of them will be relaxed. You're right, Carlos doesn't do contrived. I do hope he's right about solving his case within the next few days. If so, he's worked really quick, but I'm not complaining. I expect he had added motivation. They laughed and chatted for a while longer before Sarah turned serious. There is just one thing. Carlos is not going to be happy that you have become embroiled in another case on board ship, and even less happy about your injuries. Good point. 
We need to get this case solved before he joins us. And my wound needs to heal quickly. There's nothing like a deadline to get me going. That reminds me, I forgot to tell you about Waverley's visit. Oh? Sarah sounded concerned. No, it's not like that. He wasn't warning me off for a change. Although I'm sure that will come again. You know what he's like. Rachel explained about the row he'd had with Brenda and his father-in-law, and how Brenda had walked out. Oh, dear. I do hope he can smooth things over. Trust is so important in a relationship. The wistful tone didn't escape Rachel's notice. She took a deep breath. Sarah, Jason loves you. Whatever has happened in his past, the two of you will work it out together. I have to believe that. Otherwise, there's no hope for me and Carlos either. I hope so, Rachel, for all our sakes. For my part, there's always something missing because I know that Jason finds it so difficult to completely commit. It must be hard for Carlos. Perhaps you and Jason should talk, and me and Carlos can console each other over our half-hearted lovers. Rachel laughed loudly. <laughs> now there's a thought. Of course, it could be worse. If you and Carlos were together, it would be too perfect. And if me and Jason were together, we'd be forever in doubt. My father always says that relationships are based on joint respect and hard work once the passion has leveled out. He should know. Your parents make it work and your dad does enough marriage counseling to be an expert on the subject. He is. And I get what he means. Just as long as he doesn't try to counsel me, he wouldn't dare. But he'd be the first one I'd go to for premarital counseling, if Jason ever gets round to asking me to marry him. At least you said yes when Carlos asked. I did. But he asked at the right time. There will be a right time for Jason. Oh, Sarah, I've just realized what you said. That means you're ready to marry if he asks. You've always said you're not ready. Rachel heard the giggle through the phone. Well, now I'm ready. I'm almost sorry because Mum will think it's her nagging that got me here, and I won't be able to deny her the satisfaction of believing it, even though it's not true. Your mum means well, Sarah. She loves you, so stop moaning. I know. We get on great as long as there's a little distance between us. Otherwise, she wants to take complete control over everything. Dad just lets her dictate the terms of their marriage. But I don't want to be like that. But they are happy. Your dad adores her and vice versa. Mums only want daughters to be happily married and taken care of. Mine does, anyway. Dad would be happy for me to be an independent single for life. But Mum wants me settled down and probably out of the police force. At least that's rational. I sometimes want you out of the police force, Rachel. It's so dangerous. Now you're sounding like your mother. They laughed again and said goodbye arranging to meet the next morning on shore. They were going on a private tour of the island of Madeira, a Christmas treat from the Bradshaws. Rachel felt the familiar fluttering in her stomach at the thought of seeing Carlos, but she needed to focus on getting this case solved. Still, she hadn't found the time or the memory to mention the Macaulays to anyone. She hoped her theory about them not being in any danger until the return journey was right. But she was taking a huge risk.